So I need to use this, yeah? Is it? Hello? Hi. Yeah. Yes. Good to go? Yeah. Yes. Brilliant. Hey, everyone. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Jess, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here tonight. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, so we're here to talk to the wonderful, wonderful Ben um, who is in Edinburgh in person, which is right. really fantastic. Um, and just to give you a wee introduction, so uh, Niven is the author of six novels now, um, amongst them the one film, which we'll be talking about, um, and this brutal house, um, and uh, diary of a film was long listed for the Gordon Prize developed for the screen, which I will ask you about later. Uh, this brutal house was long listed for the Yellow Prize and shortlisted for the Polari and Gordon Byrne prizes, and it's another book which you must read. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely serious if you haven't um and it's just yeah it's going from strength to strength i think uh, so i thought we should uh well we were talking about uh downstairs should we start with a wee reading maybe yes. yeah and then we'll chat and we'll open up for questions from the audience as well and are we doing questions from the chat as well yeah. so if you're at home watching this uh, please do feel free to pop your questions in the chat and my we will um relay them to us all right awesome is this no, I don't know. Just a little. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Okay. So I'm going to read really from the very beginning of the book. So just as a quick kind of um, preview. So this is a book really um, exploring what it means to have a creative life. And it's. Um, narrated by an auteur, uh, like the director, who has flown into an Italian film festival to premiere his new film. And um, over the three days of the film festival, he's sort of grappling with this, um, the notion of giving up his work to put it before an audience, but at the same time, trying to work out what comes next in the book is kind of an unfolding of both those things. So um, let me read from the beginning. Right, okay. I flew to the Italian city of B to attend the film festival in late March. Our entry into the competition, a li liberal adaptation of William Maxwell's novel, The Folded Leaf, had been officially confirmed, and I was expected to participate in three days of interviews and panels to promote the release, with a jury screening on the second evening. My co-producer, Gabriella, had arrived at the start of the week to prepare, also the cast, we were busy hawking other projects about which I was both curious and jealous. It's hard to think of actors, good actors, as anything other than your own once you've worked with them. I knew they'd be wanting, they'd be expecting me to see their films while I was there, wanting their betrayals to be blessed, and I anticipated that it would hurt as much as watching them with other lovers, a feeling especially pronounced when the new film was still warm on my lips. Eight months of past production of Apps and Unders, their company, particularly the two leads, Laurie and Tom, who had a youth release that blended seamlessly into our production family. Nothing of the film could be changed at this point, and I've made my peace with it, absorbing the heightened pressure of meeting strict deadlines in order to screen in this competition. There were other festivals through the spring and summer, but this was the one that mattered to me, having previously brought me luck and with it a sense of calm. But for my confidence, I arrived in the city feeling apprehensive. The trip had the air of both a working holiday and a funeral. There was excitement for the next stage in the film's journey, one in which I envisaged only good things, but also a finality, for with it my participation would cease. It was for Gabby, the actors and their publicists, to take the baton and run for the glory they dreamed of. I could return to my hometown of S, regroup and retreat into my ideas. My first impulse on arriving at the airport was to have the car take me directly to the hotel. So keen was I to see Lloyd and Tom again, to hear their voices and to feel their breath. I wanted to suffer their tender, respectful mockery, typical of young Americans who've been brought up well. But I was also aware that this would be the last time that I'd play their lovely gods, and I wished to delay that. They'd not yet seen the completed film, so therefore a realm existed where they could not be disappointed in me. It wasn't the first time that I explicitly sought the love of my actors, 
There's an almost supernatural aura of openness, risk-taking and safety present in the shooting of some films that doesn't exist in others. As always, we've been pressured by a tight shooting schedule and insufficient money, but the folded leaf was nourished by magic. It informed the, break, the breaking light of drawn shooting and held its power over us until the end of the day. Drunk on its potency, it interrupted my sleep for much of the principal photography. So keen was I not to lose this holy atmosphere, feeling the mist were clear and waking. I'm not a superstitious man. There's no room for the Ouija in filmmaking, but we were all touched by the same feeling and simply wished this gift to stay. It was something I hoped was honoured in the final cut and by which Laurie and Tom's faith in me would be justified as mine already was with them. I asked the driver to take me to the harbour where the fishermen were delivering their catch with a strict instruction to collect me at the same spot in half an hour. My late grandparents lived in a fishing village, so there was something resolutely familiar in watching the boats come in. Fishermen from the one trawler docked carried a procession of buckets to a line of trestle tables holding large polystyrene boxes loaded with ice. I was taken back to childhood and the surprise of seeing what was there, watching as the buckets were sweetly upturned, a shower of fish clattering in their new ice boxes. Then, as now, there was something depressing about being unable to compete with nature and how much of its infinitesimal wonder could outsmart the camera. My film was set in the Italian countryside, and though the gardens were lit by angels, the fruit trees fulsome and glowing, they did not contain the life that tumbled before me. I thought of parental disappointment, where a child follows a lesser path, only the state of the film was entirely down to my hands. I was no bystander, but responsible for all of it. The woman on the other side of the table was shouting at me for blocking the view of others who were waiting to buy. I was awake to the laughter of the ground fishermen as they sluiced the blood and guts from the cobbles with buckets of fresh seawater and the attack cry of the gulls that hovered above. Get a move on, came the man's voice. What are you doing? asked another. Make your decision somewhere else, mate. I seemed to move further back into the crowd, but I knew that I would not leave that by the fish. It eventually taking what was left in the box, a grouper and a sickly looking grey mullet, and go back to the car. The bag was the thinnest white pouch, which, which allowed the rough texture of the grouper's scales to graze my palms as I walked. I held the bag by its flimsy handle, but instead I held out the package horizontally before me, as if making an offering to, to anyone who stopped and acknowledged my presence. My film was offered on the terms. By walking into the hotel and the suite reserved for my first meeting with Gabby and the cast, and then subsequently with journalists and potential distributors, I too was making an offering as pure and sincere as the catch turning rigid in my hands, until I suddenly felt embarrassed, dumping the package in the gutter before we drove away. I looked at my gesture, rotting in the sun until it was out of sight, hoping the girls would sense that it was there and quickly destroy the evidence talons tearing through plastic to reach flesh and bone, pecking and chewing until nothing remained. Thanks. Just to end this, <laughs> uh, which I don't think I thought about when I first uh, read it and not doing my reread either, but it's just such a perfect image of like, going in fully vulnerable to something and, yeah, and not much. sort of wanting people to maybe see all the work that's behind or all the like ugly bits that are kind of um, behind. Uh, I mean, I think it's just such a, one of the reasons that I really love this book is that it like, it meets people. If you're a person trying to create things, it meets you kind of where you are. Like it, it sort of doesn't matter where in your creative process or like how far down your career, whatever you call it, you are. It just it meets you there. Yes, that was very much the intention. Which is wonderful. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to, but I actually started, I wanted to start by asking you kind of time back to the, the bit that you read there. Um, it's set in Italy. Uh, how much of the beginning of the book, as in the beginnings of the book and starting to write it, was about location? Um, I think subconscious, I mean, everything I write, it's the sense of place is very important to me. Um, but actually, when I first wrote those sentences, I didn't actually, no, no, it's, no. when I wrote those sentences, it was, it was, it was in Italy. Um, 
but the the the, the, the sort of leads up to that moment is obviously a very convoluted process when you're putting up books. And what happens with me is I'm sort of finishing a, a previous book, which you know could take three years, whatever. But throughout that time, you are living life, you're having experiences, you're seeing art, you're seeing, you know, reading things that have nothing to do with what you're working on. And you just filter stuff in the back of your, you know, filter it away. So when you're finally in the space where you can write something new. Um, so after I finished this brutal house, what I what I didn't realise was the things that were leading up to writing this book, which was to so I went to I did a film degree, so I spent a lot of time just watching a lot of films, and I sort of went back to that mentality a little bit, and I watched every single Fast Finger film. I saw this, um, so he wrote he made a really amazing film called Ali Theory Eats the Soul, which is about a mixed race relationship in Berlin in the seventies with an actual colour. You just don't see, you know what I mean? It's, that in itself is sort of a baby revolutionary. You know, Fassbender is amazingly talented, just a, a genius, but is a, 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 an incredibly problematic person as a filmmaker, as an artist. So I was watching his stuff and I was watching um, Visconti all over again, just tons of Visconti stuff. So the Terra Trainer, which is basically his most kind of communist statement, is a film piece which is about. Um, a group of um, exploited fishermen who basically collectivise. So that scene in itself is sort of a nod in my head to that that kind of thing. And also, I was reading a lot of Pasolini, and I was just like kind of living in it in my head and reading a lot of kind of novels from the mid twentieth century people like Natalia Ginsburg. Um, so you kind of write stuff, but then with all my books, what happens is I get to a point where I literally write. A couple of pages and I look and say well, that's the book and it's unchanged so kind of what I read is what I wrote what, oh, I kind of was like okay this is this is kind of this is I know what I'm doing mm-hmm. so I literally wrote you know I flew in and I'm adapting William Maxwell's novel and I really like William Maxwell's novel it's like a really kind of underrated kind of queer novel from kind of mid-century America it's really really stunning mm-hmm. um, and as I was writing it just, it it just made total sense. It was, you know, it's just the, the thing of the power of your subconscious with kind of a desire to get it down. So as soon as I wrote that, I was okay, I know where I am, but film festival, I'm writing about a film being made. Uh, so it, yeah, it's Italy, the illusion is that it's sort of Venice, but it isn't Venice, didn't want to write that I was in Venice, because if you write in Venice, you're back about for it has to be you're like in a sort of dream like artificial space because you're the, is, the book's being written by a man who's basically shot a film artificial environment edited it isolated environment and then comes to a film festival which is fabulously glamorous but it is also an artificial environment even though it's a city he's been to most times before everything's kind of new to him it's not really reality so it isn't you know it isn't really about trying to create a specific psychogeography with the Spruce House, for example, in the same New York. I want you to feel you in New York. But in the same way, without naming street names, and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a sense, maybe. Yeah, well, that's a different way of, of writing place. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I want to ask you loads about the kind of movement between art forms in different ways, which is so very fascinating. And I suppose one way to start is, like, um by well first asking me actually a, a very precise question which is uh you know how everyone gets asked what their favorite film is yeah. uh from a very early age yeah like i remember being about seven and like filling in like what's your favorite film and like little books and things so is there a film from when you were quite young that still holds up and that you're still sort of happy to say this is one of my favorite films Weirdly, I can't think of a film from childhood that I particularly loved, um, mainly because really we watch loads of TV. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I was like a real Doctor Who geek for about seven years old. So that is the sort of thing, maybe. Yeah. And we went to the cinema, but I, I didn't really get into watching films at all, in terms of like really being obsessed with them. Yeah. Till I was about 14, 15, the video age, where you could go to the video shop and rent stuff. And obviously you could rent stuff 
they didn't look stuff that was kind of beyond your age mm. so um and that was the sort of age i started reading that id in the face so I started reading about people who were making films and stuff like that so i remember you know a pivotal thing for me was reading hand of crush's screenplay for my beautiful old joke when i was about 15 and that really sort of blown me away and then seeing him being interviewed in my mags and writing his novel and making film and just seeing him just being a really interesting creative person who was brown was very affirmative for me in terms of me thinking at that point the able to articulate actually i think i want to write books because he can do it and i really responded to that so really on the back of those things then we just started watching loads and loads of videos so um I, oh i'll tell you one okay so Absolute Beginners, Julian Temple, from about 1985, so it's maybe about 12, something like that. So, hey, obsessed with Pat Skenzo. But that, I mean, I didn't understand who Julian Temple was at the time. He was like this punk filmmaker, and he was like this real kind of British maverick, and, you know, they spent loads of money on it, and they wanted it to be the sort of revival of the British film industry and the massive disaster. But that film has real magic to me. But, yeah, but the, the, the films actually that really stayed with me, I think, were I we I ended up start watching a lot of European art and stuff when I was about sort of 16, 17 when I started doing my A levels and we did French and stuff, so I switched notes French a bit. So see Jack Rivette, I don't know if anyone knows Jack Rivette, who's a new wave film director from the 60s. So his film La Belle Noiseuse, which is this four hour epic of um an artist painting woman over the course of the summer in South France was absolutely informative for me and I always go back to that probably that was the really film. Great that's uh, I feel like I'm making mental notes which is <laughs> the best kind of conversation and um, so uh, one of the things that I thought about in the say the movement between writing and film I suppose and, and everything in between is sometimes people use the word translation even when it's uh, talking about interpreting something in a different art form like translated onto screen exactly yeah like is that a term that you find useful uh, not just between languages but like do you feel like that is a useful term i've never thought about it in that way in actually but yes it is yeah. helpful i always say and i say it in the book it's kind of the history of filmmaking is the history of adaptation yeah so you know from the very first moment that they were making kind of pictures they weren't always writing original things they were adapting books or they were adapting plays and so it was always about what is it in this book or this play that we can form a story of we can't build the entire book so we have to give it to someone who can say this the essence of this book for us is this happens and this happens and that's what we do so that is the thing that i find quite interesting well, because you were, you were, um, we were talking about this earlier that you're learning Italian yes. now, so there is obviously some translation going on, kind of in your head, in a different way. Yeah. Um, has that in any way made you kind of see new things in the book, in terms of it being set in Italy, for example, but also um, the translations between art forms. That does that mirror in some way what you're experiencing translating things in your head between English and Italian? Um, not not specifically, but I think you know having you know speak like so I speak French and speak a little bit of German. So and obviously you know I come from, you know my parents were both immigrants. My my mum first in her first language which my dad his first language isn't English. Um, so I'm always really aware specifically about the distance in language anyway mm. and in this book particularly because i wanted to write a book that felt very kind of european and it was my kind of um attempt to show the beauty of the european project so you've got a uh, director who's come from an unnamed eastern european country who's basically moved through all the the sort of epochs of repression in the in the, the old former Iron Curtain that's mm -hmm. found himself through mm -hmm. art, mm -hmm. who is now an international figure who could basically work in any country, he could shoot, in, you know, he, he still lives in his Eastern European country, flies to Italy, gets his tour finer, maybe in his summer, flies back to the Premier, he's got actors in from America, his, um, 
his crew and his producer come from other places. So it's, it's already like a meeting place. And then it's a familiar place to him, but he still feels a stranger there. And the key, one of the key pivotal characters is very early on the book, he meets a woman called Cosima, who, who is a native to that city. She's like, a, she's a writer and she, she's like an art sort of guide. And they have a very instant connection that goes beyond the kind of distance between language, which is she too, they're similar ages. She has come through the same kind of um, um, social upheavals, if you think of kind of the, the political kind of upheavals and societal upheavals in Italy, sort of from like the 70s onwards, years from there, all that kind of stuff. And she's also a great person who's found her way through all those things. So they kind of find a common space between that. Mm -hmm. um, but in particular to translation, actually, there's an interesting bit where he, he finds that she's a writer and then he sort of says someone, you must find me her books. And they, her books appear and he reads one. But he gets them delivered in, in, in a number of languages and to decide which language he will read her in to, to, to work out how he can best understand her. Um, and he, he has an it's Italian translation, he has the Italian version and then a French translation. And he chooses the Italian, even though maybe his French is better, but he feels he can only understand her better by reading that originally and how she originally intended to yeah. express herself in with the a dictionary next with a dictionary. <laughs> that's right. But that's how you learn, you know, that's how you know I'm learning language. That's how you that's how you yeah, learn. Yeah, you sit with a sure. dictionary. What were these words? Absolutely. And there's um so there's a lot of walking in the book and, yes. and obviously that's how we um experience the city that they're in. And one thing that I found myself thinking particularly in the walking scenes is that this exact sense of following a character through every moment of um, walking through a room or walking across a square or like walking through a city, it wouldn't be possible in the same way in film, uh, which is a, it's a very interesting kind of lens to have when you're reading a book because film is so important in it. So I almost started like comparing stuff like what would this look like sort of thing. Um, so I, I wonder. I want to see that film. Yeah. <laughs> I actually really want to see. They made, I'm trying to think if someone, if someone made a film with that kind of POV. I'm sure someone might. Um, I mean, it feels, it just makes you really aware of what's possible and what writing is good at, yeah. I suppose, in yeah. a different way. Very much. Um, and so there's a couple of questions about that. And first is, has on the other, like in the opposite direction, has film taught you anything about writing, particularly in terms of movement and how to how to depict movement, you know, bodies going from one place to another. Um, what I suppose the the main thing that I took from after I left Goldsmith, so that's a film, was um, well, actually, there's two things: a the kind of creative work ethic of being at Goldsmith, which was just a really kind of cool art school, actually, which was just just to keep making work. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's great that you do one thing, but life doesn't end, you know, just because you've made something, no mm -hmm. cares. You have to just keep doing it and you can't be precious about it. So that was the most, that was one of the most important things. Specifically in terms of film, I really liked editing. I used to mm -hmm. shoot on 16 mil. So I actually physically liked put splice in film, you know, on a cutter and taping it together, running it through. And seeing how every time you cut, you could cut the same scene differently, like four or five times, and give you a different kind of experience. So that sort of gave me something in terms of just how I structure things, because I'm always thinking yeah, of the yeah. possibilities before I kind of, as I'm writing it down, as I'm trying to commit to it. So there was that. Um, what the biggest thing that film gives me now actually is to see um just to, to actually be in front of a visual dynamic so when you're writing you're constantly you know it's a very kind of introspective process and actually just watching films takes you out of that a little and sometimes just reminds you of things like action is really important <laughs> and you know I'm things not, need to happen <laughs> yeah, but then you know the, the beauty of literature is that we can we can argue forever that things don't need to happen mm. um so that that is I find I find that helpful because also I'm not my books aren't plot heavy I'm not you know I'm not interested in writing 
to write a lovely story with a plot, even though it does have a plot. I, I find it through the writing. So watching films is one of the things that kind of, um, it's just like a little bit of kind of, it's half a cheerleading thing, but it's also a bit of a wake up call, um, just to remind myself that things actually happen in the world. That's a really interesting one. Because actually this book, you know, the way that you said it's someone walking around, it could have been completely different in the sense of someone walking around. It could have been far more introspective that things have to happen. Yeah. Um, and also it's, um, I don't know if anyone has read Lauren Elkin's book, Flanners. Um, and, you know, Lauren is a genius writer. And I read that book when it came out and um, I was just really blown away by it. And, um, just, you know, just felt to be like a kindred spirit. It's like, this book is really fucking amazing. And, um, you know, walking around cities, it's literally like one of my favorite things to do. So I just wanted to get that kind of sense of, you know, yeah, yeah. possibility. <laughs> Which is definitely in the book, for sure. Um, going in the opposite direction, I wondered, which is not very common, I think, have you ever come across an example of a book or a, a rather a film that's been kind of revealed new ways or become you know made, basically made a good book like the other way around because we talk about adaptations of books and written works made into visual oh okay but what about the other way around i asked that in a really convoluted way <laughs> <laughs> um i'm not sure actually I mean, yeah, um, I mean, I, don't, I can't do you think remember, of any. I but... mean, you know, in the eighties, they were really big novelizations of massive films. Okay, right. So yeah. that and that yeah. was that was yeah. a proper thing. Yeah. That was like yeah. a really proper thing. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I wonder what you. Can I, I see a lot. That. I see a lot of really great films, and there's something. There's an essence, or there's something tonally, which that's the thing I always respond to in art, something tonally that speaks to me, mm -hmm. that I feel my instant response to seeing something amazing, whether it's a painting or, or particularly film, is I want to reflect that tonally in my own work. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there's a couple of films I've seen recently where I kind of feel like. What makes you most excited about the thought of this uh, becoming a film? Um, what uh, aspects of it? I, I mean, I'm interested in the process. I'm interested in process. So, um, so first of all, you know, 99% of books that are optioned are never made into films. They just fall off okay. whatever heard of. Because it's just incredibly complicated. There's just a lot of people involved. There's a lot of money involved. Well, there's not a lot of money involved, but that's why things fall. Mm -hmm. um, and it's to do with the kind of people that are involved. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I'm just interested to see how far we can take it. Yeah. So we've got a really cool producer who's really dynamic and interesting, and we're kind of very much on the same page. Um, and we're going to see where where we take it. But it, it you know, it's it's the start of a very long journey. Mm -hmm. And also, I'm sort of involved, but I'm not involved because I don't write the script for it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Because kind of everything I've said is in the book, mm -hmm. so I don't, yeah. you know. Well, that sort of brings me to something else that I wanted to ask you about, and that is the art as collaboration, basically, which, you know, is much more obvious in the world of film, but still exists in the world of writing and, and you know, maybe isn't appreciated as, as much as it kind of should be. And there's actually a quote in the, um, or a, a bit of the book that uh, I thought was so wonderful, which I'm just going to read out very quickly. Uh, it's on page 19. <laughs> uh, you cannot make films if you're unable to speak or to accept the presence of other human beings. Without those things, you're simply creating art installations, important in themselves, but they are not cinema, and that is what I'm here to teach you. I wonder if that could apply to writing as well, in some way. It's a uh... It can in the sense that, you know, if you're, if you're trying to make work that reflects life, you have to give it life. Mm. So mm. it can't be, it can't be dead. You know, that, that's the thing. Yeah. And um, the, you know, this, it's, this book is very much kind of a book conversation. So there's, there's just many conversations between him, a filmmaker, 
and customer a writer. And he's basically just blown away by her because he's like, he has the sort of similar reaction to I have when you see something amazing, which is kind of, who is this person? How has she done this amazing thing? I need to know everything about you. She can tell me how you did it. Mm -hmm. you know, so he, and he's blown away by it because although he writes and directs, the whole process is collaborative. So the fact that she can, she basically makes such amazing work on her own to know kind of and there, he is just sort of blown away by it. And it's, you know, it's sort of humbled by it. It's maybe a little jealous of it. Feels, you know, so, so that is the kind of, you know, those are the sort of thrust of those kind of conversations. So he said, you know, I'm a collaborative person and I do this, but you're not a collaborative person and you've given this, this seems to have more value to me. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's funny because it made me actually think about all the collaborations that go into books as well, that after all, you know, we see it as a very lonely um, endeavour, which it is in some ways, but actually we depend on other people for, for writing books. I think... I think the thing with writing is it, it's as collaborative as you want to be. Yeah. I think that's the difference. Mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons that I that I write, um, so, you know, I went to film school, but I knew that I would never make a film because, A, I'm not a patient person, and you'd be surrounded by people who were, um, you know, working on projects for, like, five years, and, you know, it's just too long. I couldn't do that. But also, I'm just not collaborative. I, I didn't feel that I could really write scripts and then have them torn to pieces and then have other people's input I wasn't I'm just not that generous of a person so you know what I like about writing for me is it's kind of it's very much my own point of view when it's finished then of course I'll be showing it to people my editor my agent and we have conversations and I kind of want that feedback but when I finish the book I get to the point where I have to be really really sure of what it is mm -hmm. so then when people come and say oh you know, what do you think of this? I'm like, I'm already sure. Okay, yeah. So that's kind of my, that's, really interesting. that's kind of how I do it. I don't, I don't necessarily, and I think it's only because I studied film. If I didn't study film, that process, I might be open more to that notion of collaboration, but actually I quite I firmly resist it. And that's really interesting. So it kind of taught you to uh, find a way to trust yourself in a way. Yeah, and yeah. no, it really is because the most of, one of the most important things I've ever learned about writing is that you have to be so honest. With you you have to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. So basically, you have to accept that not every single sentence you ever write is going to be the most genius thing. And just because you've written one book, that might be all right. It doesn't mean that the next one will. Mm -hmm. And you have to not be so. Um, you know, it's just a balance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but at heart, basically, I have to be sure that everything I write, by the time I write it, it is literally the best it can possibly be, and I've literally worked through every possible angle to to till the kind of bits are end. And then you can, you can make the, yeah, yeah, because then I feel okay. Well, I'm really, really sure of it. So when I say to someone, I finished it and it's good, I'm not bragging. I do think it's good. Well, there's an uh, so another aspect to um, the collaborations, I suppose, is there's this lovely bit which talks about finding your people, yeah. um, which I thought was so wonderful. And I wonder, you know, what does it, what, what do can, what's the importance of communities in terms of trying to lead a creative life? What does it mean for to because it actually it made me also think of this brutal house yeah. um, and the way that you write about chosen families in that book, which is uh, about Vogue culture and about um, the mothers of these houses and, you know, uh, kids that find a chosen home, I suppose, uh, which I think is it's just a nice connection. Yeah, sure. Um, so like what, yeah, what's the importance of chosen families for leading creative lives? I think... Maybe for me, let's show some families. It's all they do. Yes, finding your people, mm. finding people that you have some kind of connection with, mm. who um, you might not necessarily stick the same things, mm. but you have there's certain kind of create sympathies because mm. you you do need people around you. Writing is is an incredibly isolated business. So actually, to have a community of writers around, you know, I found the, my community of writers pretty much through Twitter. 
and doing events. You know, like my first couple of books, I was doing events and stuff, but I wasn't really meeting loads of writers. And it felt really kind of quite isolating. So sort of between my second and third books, I was kind of doing loads of events. And I was just starting to meet other writers that people I liked. And, um, and that's kind of when Twitter started. Like when my first book came out, it wasn't even my space, I was like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? That like literally, you had to just send postcards to people to say, you had a book coming out. It was really kind of quite nuts. And then when my second book came out, there was MySpace. And I was sort of connecting with readers with MySpace. So that was quite odd. Um, and then Twitter changed the game because then I could just talk to writers directly. Or people would come to me and say, oh, I really like what you're doing. It's like, you know you, you, have a, you know what my work is. That was weird. And then I would have those same conversations with other people. And then you would meet people. And then, you know. You would... That's wonderful. That's good. And then sometimes you don't meet those people. But just having a community of people you can speak to online and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I'm a bit out of twist these days. But actually yeah, what it did change. give me, yeah, it has. Mm-hmm. But what it did give me was kind of a community of writers, a community of queer creative people. Um, and maybe like Instagram is far more um, conducive to kind of connecting with kind of queer creatives these days. Mm-hmm. So there's just, you know, there's just a way that you can kind of reach out. I think if I was 17 again, I'm thinking, yeah, I want to write books, so I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. Now I'd be like, oh, I can just hear someone say, oh, I really liked your book, or you go to an event, and they won't be events really, or we didn't know how to get to those events. Those kind of it just didn't seem accessible to us. Mm-hmm. And you know, for all the bad things about social media, what it really does is is level the playing field and make everything accessible because mm-hmm. you just follow people and just you know actually say things. Yeah, and and just like, sort of yeah, and you feel that you can speak to people. So that community I find massively helpful and even you know especially with the pandemic you haven't seen anyone in two years <laughs> just to be able to speak to people and you know we you know you can cheerlead people they cheerlead you mm-hmm. you know the people I have conversations with throughout as I'm writing the book and we're just sort of you know cheering each other up to just keep doing it it's really helpful and you know there's certain points where you're not sure what you're doing and then someone will say something to you like you know how is it going, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it kind of really kind of spurs you on a bit. Yeah, it's like a sense of belonging, I suppose, as well. Yeah. Like you kind of have a, have a place to yeah. somewhere to sit. Uh, something else that obviously we haven't talked about, and it's so beautiful, is the way that... Uh, the, so you've got one... Uh, well, do you love... Uh, yeah, they, you, yeah, 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 totally. So there's the there's the more mature love story of the narrator and his husband. It's and like the like, parents and the kids. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the two actors. Um, and I just love the way that the narrator kind of looks at these two people and their very young, very like new love, and reflects on like his own relationship. And that made me think of the fact that they're actors and that this is, you know, they're, they're sort of finding a way to be authentic in themselves and like find authenticity in this, in this line of work and, and ask for people. So um, I wonder what possibilities were kind of given to you in creating these characters by the fact that they are actors. Does um, that make sense? It's a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, A, it, it, you know, it's supposed to feel kind of quite maternal in that kind of sense like he is their people he's like their cheerleader mm. but I mean yeah I find actors really interesting mm. in that sense that you know like the director but more so the whole environment is artificial and you're there to bring authenticity to something being artificial mm. um, which in itself is obviously a very intense process so what is it within that process that you take out of it yeah. once you've kind of wrapped so for them it's like a fledgling relationship but it doesn't, you know, but the nature of their business doesn't necessarily mean it would ever last the distance. It is a thing of its time and they accept it. But it, 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 it's of its time, of this moment, where it goes, that's kind of up to you as a reader to decide. Um, but, you know, he sort of uses constantly on the kind of changing um, assets of actors in all parts of their kind of everyday and professional life, how they can just switch you know yeah like that when they need to to you know just, just change yeah. their personality whether it's to protect themselves or to be more open up you know to open up more or whatever mm-hmm. um in a way you know he's sort of fascinated by that because he's unable to do that because yeah. you know 
people behind the camera are, 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 are much more kind of introverted, everything's much more considered, but you can't be that with an actor. If you're an actor, you have kind of do all those things and more. Plus, they kind of have a Star Wars age anyway, which in itself is that whole other type of thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really fascinating to read characters that, um, that are actors, which I haven't really thought about because you kind of get access to something that you that is also very far away. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I was yeah. thinking a lot of people like, um, so in terms of writing, I was thinking of people like Sam Shepard, you know, used to write, who writes who used to write really amazing short stories as well as acting. So I was thinking kind of a lot of about his sort of, um, just the way he could kind of switch facets and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then also in terms of kind of Hollywood, I was very much thinking about, um, there's this, it's basically about the point where act, unknown actors are on the cusp. And so they're not just on the cusp of major fame, they're on the cusp of kind of major, kind of life changes where they have to decide mm -hmm. the kind of artist they're going to be, how authentic they can stay whilst protecting themselves mm -hmm. within kind of something quite big happening, which is completely out of their control. So, um, you know, my own private Idaho, going back to kind of films I saw at a very young age that really stayed with me, that is one. And, you know, I very really watched it. And, um, you know, I saw it when it came out, like in the early 90s, and it was, you know, it was like a really pivotal thing. And the relationship with um, Keanu and River, you know, the, you know, Keanu was famous and River was famous, but this kind of took them somewhere else. It was like a real kind of moment. Um, it was like a queer moment, it was a cultural moment, you know, it was all those kind of things. And then, you know, sort of moving further on, if you think of kind of Heath Ledger and Jake in, mm. in um, Right back Mountain and um, Timothy Chalamet and I mean, call me by your name. There's those moments you have with young actors where something quite big is going to happen. And you know, obviously, these are kind of queer films we're talking about, but those dynamics kind of I find really, really interesting. Well, it, it also because it's their queer love stories, the, the vulnerability takes on, I feel, also a very specific, there's a specific vulnerability, maybe. Yeah, and also, actually, but beyond the vulnerability, what I wanted to do was take something away from those stories and write, the, the whole novel, in a lot of ways, is about kind of queer joy, kind of multi-generational queer joy. So what I wanted was basically to have queer actors or actors who um, may or may not be queer, but they're having a queer relationship, and they're not necessarily questioning it, they're just open to that kind of experience. And it's not a traumatic experience, it's a very kind of, you know... It's, it's, it's yeah, it, it's joyful. I've had more questions, but I'm just going to check in. <laughs> we yeah. have a few online as okay. well. Okay, well, let's take. Uh, should we take some online? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Um, I'll start with these, and then you guys are in the room, so yes, uh, you next. <laughs> we can do one, one, then one. Um, uh, you seem so knowledgeable across the arts. This is from Kim. Uh, literate music, art film, are there any of the arts that you aren't interested in or that you are useless at? <laughs> <laughs> Do we have to repeat that question? Uh, no, because I'm just okay, beside the repeat, so you're good. Um, I, I don't know everything about, I don't know anything <laughs> about anything. I just, I, I, I just respond to stuff that I like, I guess. So I just kind of, I just kind of have my eyes open, you know. I, I, I just like watch a lot of films. I read a lot. I go out a lot. I watch, you know. I go and look at paintings. I talk to creative people. I look and see what everyone else is doing, you know. I, I'm just curious about stuff. And actually, my work is driven, you know, by curiosity. But you know, everywhere. Well, we should mention all the days and nights as well, which is a a, a, a book of of Nivens, uh, where um, a paint a painting. Yeah, it's um, about. I mean, all the days, so all the days and nights basically is what led me to this book. So all the days and nights is it's set in the late 70s, early 80s on the east coast of America. And it's narrated by uh, a woman who's, who's probably like in her 80s and she's a portrait painter. And she's, she's quite famous and she is, she's basically known for only painting portraits of two people, her husband and her studio assistant. 
and the book starts and she's sort of frail and she's she sort of died she went on her last painting and the husband has left her and he's basically traveling around america looking at some of the paintings that they have done together while she's working on the last painting and they're both trying to work out in their own way if this kind of commitment to making work has actually been of any benefit and i finished that book and it was the first time i finished the book and i felt that there was some there were some kind of questions that were really sort of unfinished for me and i was and i didn't know i didn't know what it was i just felt that something was unfinished i was like i really like that for trilogy but not a sequel there was just something and i couldn't articulate it and then i wrote this brutal house and then as i started writing this and i, I was just i wanted to write that film phrase i thought i read to write that something about filmmaking i thought oh this is what i'm doing i basically write about people who make stuff but there's been like an eight year gap between the two novels so what is it in these eight years that i've learned or has changed me that may will make they're different basically i realized that i wanted to kind of write books like a group together in certain ways so there'll be a third book at some point which will be about some kind of creative process but I don't know when that will be or how. Um, That's so exciting. That's great. Is it the, the people who make stuff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love I that. I just use it like make, we sort of say makers. I yeah. didn't want to say artists because it isn't necessarily about always being creating art. I'm interested in you know, people using their hands and actually producing. So. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's great. I look forward to that. Did we? Uh, do you have any questions here, by the way? Do we have any questions in the in the live audience? Um, well, I've got more online. Yes, let's. Do um, so, uh, someone called Teddy asked, um, "What you say about cutting film uh, is fascinating to me as a writer. Do you have any other tips for writers who love to write character first rather than plot?" Mm -hmm. um, great question. Um, I think my only suggestion really is that you kind of find it through the writing. I think the more you put down, the more you can kind of see a way forward, I think is the best way to think about it. Um, you know, I know there's, there's, I'm never really, I can never be really prescriptive on the best way to do things. I think you kind of have to find a way that works for you. When I first started writing, even after my first book, and I'd read, you know, like the Guardian used to do is this sort of very high polluting kind of column of the week where writers would talk about their process and stuff. And I would still read it because I was like, is there a right way? And also, I never was kind of a right, you know, I didn't do a great writing, but they could nothing worse, it just wasn't for me. Mm. So it's, it's about finding a way to do it where you just get something down and you feel you can kind of keep moving forward every day a little bit. That's kind of the trick, I think. Also, uh, the other thing I think is. Sometimes it's really good if you get too up in your head and it feels too insular. It's scared just to jump. And that's what Bill taught me, to jump sometimes. Because you could easily write a whole book about just someone walking around for two hours. That could easily be a book. But sometimes you have to just jump and be brave and say, I'm going to jump to what happens a year later or, you know, the next day or six months from now. So don't be, don't be scared to, to jump, I think. Cool. Uh, next one down, Jean, a question after Manhart. I put this to you in a way. Uh, Jean asks, um, or maybe it's Jean, who knows? Um, I love uh, my hardback edition of the book, but seeing paperback has made me want one of those too. What's the picture and why the redesign? Um, well, you know, a dual purchase is always good. <laughs> <laughs> I like completists. I'm a completist, I'm a format completist. Um, I think. I mean, you know, there's a lot of very boring things which never really interest me when publishers say, you know, obviously, you know, paper, paperback market is a different thing. There's people who, who aren't interested in your hardbacks or that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but from my point of view, it's really interested in any chance to present it in a different way. So the original cover for the hardback, um, which Luke Bird's, um designed with Nico Taylor. Um, it's stunning, you know, it's iconic for me, I absolutely love it, it's amazing. But it would have been very easy just to replicate it for a paperback or do it in a different colour or whatever. Um, so it's, you know, it's a chance to revisit and you don't often get a chance to revisit once your work is out. So we all kind of had input, I mean, I was really kind of quite boring here. 
um, and quite angle. Uh, and it took a really long time, but really I wanted it, I wanted to ramp up the Europeanness of it. I wanted it to feel, you know, quite European and quite um, modernist and quite minimal. I wanted it to feel like a sort of an art catalogue. Um, and the photographer is a really cool photographer called, called Stefan Fitt Taylor, and who's on Instagram, it's worth following. And he takes amazing interiors and shoots for like Casa Vogue and some really cool magazines. And he does tons of stuff in Italy and Spain and in France. And his work's really amazing. Um, and I like interiors. So as soon as I saw his work and I saw that, that, that picture for me, it really spoke to me. Because also the book is about how um, you know, part of it is about gentrification and abandonment and desolate buildings and walking into rooms that are full of stories that are empty rooms. So it kind of just really worked. I, I'm going to ask a question now. Oh, thank you. I'm <laughs> you have a is that okay? Just, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because I felt that this was really important and realised that I haven't asked you about it. So a big part of the book is obviously um, what happens between the narrator and Cosima. Yeah. Um, and the question of, yeah, the narrator having this creative drive and having this pull to the story, which also belongs to someone else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it made me think, think about the, we often hear that it's not sustainable to create art for for praise, that, that that as a driving force is not sustainable. But it's not necessarily the same thing as not caring what people think. So I sort of wanted, wanted to kind of inquire that, um, ask you a bit about the difference between, you know, seeking praise and also just not caring what people think, because that's when responsibility comes in and where you know people can get hurt and, and that sort of thing is that something that you could kind of figure out with each book as it comes along who your responsibility is to i think i think the main thing is that obviously you you know art doesn't exist in the vacuum mm. you might you, you create something the way it has to come but i write you know when i'm writing i'm pretty much I'm not, I'm writing for myself. I'm writing to do the thing mm. is the best way I can explain it and to do it in the way that makes sense to me in the best way I possibly could. Now, Philip Roth has this great line where he says, you know, when he stopped writing, he said, you know, oh, I just did the best with what I had. Love that line. Because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, all you can do is everything you know up to that point. So when I think about my first book, I probably never write that book the same way again. But it, at the time, it was everything I could possibly put into a book. The more you write books or the more I write books, I am not as I'm writing it, but when I have page in front of me, I am thinking a little bit more about it will be seen and how it's going to be presented. Um, so that's that's as much as I can say, really. The notion of responsibility, I think, is a very personal thing to anyone who makes work. And this book is a good kind of um, summation of it, which is which is basically like, don't be an arsehole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, you know, being a decent human being, you yeah, can still yeah. make amazing work, but you kind of, you know when, you know, you mm. don't need, people don't need to be told. Yeah, yeah. But people do need to be told, so. Yeah. But, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's, yeah. that's, yeah, I think that, that's, that's kind of my kind of line. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great answer. Do do we have any more questions? We have we have one more from Lewis on Okay, well let's let's do Lewis's question and um, then we'll ask a final question. Which was asked towards the beginning. Um so in response, so Lewis says, given the vague psychogeography of the new book, have you found readers recognize real places? And were you worried about it not having that place connection that this brutal house had? Um Weirdly, the feedback in, from readers is it's it, the thing about writing about film is it's your own kind of personal um, projection space. So everything that film and place means to you, you you know you project kind of your your version of Italy through reading this book. 
or being in a European city. In many ways, this book could have been set in any European city. It, it, it really has that kind of sense of, of um, it has that kind of scope in terms of what you want to um, kind of project onto mm -hmm. it, I guess. I mean, so that was like the challenge to me. How do you create a sense of place without being really specific about the town? And that's kind of what I was trying to create. But because he doesn't know the town that well and they're in a dream space, it's very, it gives you that scope to be kind of non-specific. Um, and, you know, it's informed by going to Italy a bit, but going to lots of European countries and um, thinking about gentrification and the, the positive and negative impacts of tourism on places and all those kind of things. So, um, and also I think it's, it's sort of been exacerbated by the pandemic because we haven't been able to travel for so long. So you can read this kind of book. And the main feedback from this book has been, you know, this just reminds me of just going on holiday, just sitting at a cafe and walking down the streets and just feeling free when I'm not free. Mm -hmm. um, so in that way, I'm, I'm quite happy to have been a service. <laughs> the longing. I mean, yeah. there is a lot of longing in the book, isn't there? Um, I'm going to ask a final question because I think, yeah, we're, we're sort of at, yeah, we're a bit over. Um, it's a, it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's two questions in one. Um, what's the scary, having written six books now, what's this, have you found a pattern in what the scariest point in the book writing process is and the most exciting one? Um, no, because it's all, the whole thing is scary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's not scary. I mean, you know, I, I love to write. So actually, when I'm in a project, I'm really, like, cannot be happier. You know, it, it's daunting and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, I, I like it. In the back of my mind, I'm always, you know, you are a sentence away from fucking it up completely. <laughs> that is, that, you know, that, that is a very basic kind of bit. Because, you know, and also this is really boring. I write by hand. So I'm physically writing it. So I'm always very aware that I could literally just write one sentence and turn it off kill to me. Well, you're not going to do that. You just have to not think about it. In that way. Wow. Is it, is it all written by hand? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you type it up then? Yeah. I sort of write it and I sort of give a massive sort of sigh relief, it's done. And then I sort of shed a few tears and think, right now I've got to type it. Why did I do it this way? I'm just it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the way that works for me. Like every single book is starting with me right by hand. Um, and sometimes I sort of mix it up a bit. Like I spent a lot of the pandemic using a typewriter. Um, I remember 